So, we've told you about the competition. We've told you about how you can take your ideas from the competition even further. But if that isn't motivation enough, we want to introduce a very special guest who will be here to motivate you. Sanjay Park is here with us today, and uh, we've had the privilege of having Sanjay with us at Hack ATL last year as well. And he's been a really great uh, person who supported us through this process. He's a founder of Startup Riot, and also the co-founder of Shop Pet Ventures. Beyond that, he's also the former CEO of Digital Envoy. And it's an IP-based geographic targeting technology company, which was sold to Landmark Communications. Now, you can see what's all on the board, but really what he is, is he's the right person to kind of instill the motivation and instill the kind of drive that you people will need over the next three days. It's going to be tough, you will have great ideas, but you'll come across a few hurdles. And we want to make sure that you have all the motivation, and all the drive, and all that passion to make sure that you make it through this. So without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Sanjay Park. How's everybody doing? Hear me? Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to apologize from the get-go. If I look a little stiff, it's because I've got a crick in my neck. So turning is, is a little bit hard, but uh, I'm going to muscle through it here. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit of an interactive talk, okay? I know there's people somewhere watching on another room somewhere. Uh, so you guys are not going to be able to be interactive with us, but uh, I expect you all that are here in the room with me uh, to do so. Uh, again, my name is Sanjay Park. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and then I'm going to tell you some other stories uh, right after that. Uh, some of you have probably seen me from last year. How many were here last year? Good number. Okay. I know almost all you guys were here last year. Uh, are you guys going to stand the whole time? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, if, they, if they're not interacting with me, I'll just come talk to you all. Um, so, Years ago, back in 1999, I started a company called Digital Envoy. Anybody heard of Digital Envoy? Other than the ones that have heard me do this talk before. It doesn't count if you've heard me do the talk. Uh, I started this company called Digital Envoy. Uh, now, most of you have been impacted by the technology that I developed. You just never knew about it. Um, you've seen probably sites like this, right? Has everybody seen this? FedEx, yeah. Pick your country. Uh, IKEA, yeah. You've probably seen that. You've seen UPS, something like that, right? So one night I actually hit those first two sites, uh, FedEx and IKEA, and the first thing they asked is, what country are you in? And I thought that was the stupidest thing ever, right? When you go into a store, you don't tell them that I'm going to use English in dollars. So why would you ever do that on the internet? It just didn't make any sense. And more so, if you don't speak English, how do you answer this question? <laughs> Not this question, but you know, the question. <laughs> So that's what I invented. I invented a way to know where somebody was on the internet geographically, knowing only their IP address. Everybody use Facebook? Yeah, so you're impacted by my technology. Uh, anybody use Hulu? Yeah. Yeah, well, you can't watch Hulu outside of the US. Uh, that's my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the flip side of it is, though, if my technology didn't exist, Hulu wouldn't be able to do what they do. Because they wouldn't have gotten the contractual uh, agreements in place to get access to that content. They wouldn't be able to stream because they couldn't control where those streams went. Too bright. Too bright up here? So uh, here is actually an example. This is an old example because I did a screenshot a long time ago and I'm too lazy to update it. Uh, but on the right side there you can see and nobody uses ask anymore for searching anything. Um, how many, how many DuckDuckGo users here? I like all y'all. Uh, the rest of you should be using DuckDuckGo, by the way. Um, uh, so right here you can see, uh, you can do a search for Italian food, and on the right side, uh, there's targeted advertising because of the IP address of the user. The interesting thing, though, is, um, is I was talking to this guy. Does anybody know who this is? Vint Surf. Vint very good. Um, so, in case you don't know who Vint is, uh, he's actually one of the two guys that invented the internet. Uh, not many people can say that. Uh, uh, in fact, only two people can say that. Uh, so, him and Bob Kahn uh, actually invented TCPIP, which is the underpinnings of, 
of the internet. Uh, interesting side note here, just recently, uh, if you don't know uh, Vint, you may or may not know Tim Berners-Lee. Do you know who Tim Berners-Lee is? Yeah? Invented the World Wide Web. Uh, so the two of them uh, are often confused and mistaken. Uh, and so they got t-shirts from somebody, I forgot who it was. Uh, Vint says, uh, on the front, I invented the internet. On the back says, I did not invent the World Wide Web. And Tim Berners-Lee says, I didn't invent the internet, and I did invent the World Wide Web. Uh, clearly, that is a nerd joke, because none of you is laughing, and so it is. Uh, anyways, uh, I met Vint about, uh, about 10 years ago, actually, this year. Uh, and he was at MCI at that point. MCI, of course, no longer exists. Uh, and sat down, I was really excited, you know, hero and idol, guys that invented the internet. Uh, and I sat down with him and said, well, you know, I'll explain what I did and IQ location. And he goes, you know, when I designed the internet, it was with the intention that what you're doing would not be possible. And then there was this pause. <laughs> And in that pause, it could have gone really, really badly, or it could have gone okay. And fortunately, it went okay, because after the pause, he goes, but I think it's really cool, and it's awesome what you're doing, and I think we can use it in this way, that way, and the other. And that was kind of awesome. Um, what was interesting was, was, you know, I was there, young guy, I was probably 30 at the point, uh, talking to somebody that had invented the internet in the 70s, uh, and I'd basically broken what he had designed. And yet, he was still pretty happy about it. So these are some of the companies that today use the technology. Uh, I'm sure all of you all recognize at least one or more of these logos at this point. So um, if you use any of these folks, if you didn't use any of their products, uh, you are being impacted by the technology that I created. But I'm not here just to tell you about kind of the things that I've done. Uh, I want to tell you a couple of other stories. Does anybody know who this is? Actually, people. It's not Tim Berners Lee, no. Um, <laughs> horrible and shockingly bad. Uh, uh, this is not stock photography. It almost looks like stock photography. Um, her name is Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, she's about 30 years old now. Uh, 11 years ago, when she was 19, she dropped out of Stanford to start a company. That company is Theranos. Theranos, I think that's how you say it. Uh, if you don't know her, you probably don't know them. Uh, and there's a reason, because they're still kind of uh, getting out there, but I'm going to tell you what they do. Does anybody know what these are? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's to collect blood. So it's the, the vials that, you know, nobody likes it. Right? You go to the doctor and they tell you they're going to drop blood. Uh, okay. So they have all these different vials. And the reason why they have all these different vials is because they have to do tests in different ways for different things that you need tested, right? So different caps uh, identify the reagents that are in there to store the blood because usually what does it take? It takes like a week to get your blood tested, right? You get sent off to a lab and you know, someday at some point you're going to find out what's wrong with you or if there's nothing wrong with you. Um, you're going to find that out. Well, what this company has done is instead of drawing a vial full, full of blood, they take a little tiny vial and it's a fingerprint. And in fact, in this little vial, they can do up to 30 different tests from just that amount of blood. And in case you don't realize how big this is, that's a vial, a regular vial, on the left, and their vial on the right. And in case you really don't, can't tell, that's how big it is. That's how much blood we're talking about. Now, the amazing thing is not just that it's a little tiny amount of blood, but the fact is, is that they can figure out in about three to four hours the tests that they need to do on your blood, they're done. Okay, that's not the only amazing thing about it. The other amazing thing is that they are now saying the cost of doing some of these tests are going to be so low, it's ridiculous. Testing your cholesterol is going to cost something like three or four dollars. Three or four dollars. And you're going to know in four hours what your cholesterol is. Has everybody had the cholesterol tested before? Or you get a fast the night before, and go in, and you're starving, and they won't take your blood, and you're like, I want to eat. You finally take your blood, and then you can't eat because then the doctor comes in, and then you've got to wait another hour or something. Right? This, and, and you don't find out what your cholesterol is for another week after that suffering of, of not having to eat from the night before. These 
folks have gone in and they've taken something that we've been doing for years and years and totally changed the way that it's going to work. Right? You look at that tiny little vial, there's no reagents, there's no storing of the blood because they're going to process it right away, right there. Um, I think they've, they've now rolled out into Walgreens in, in California, I think maybe Arizona. And so you can go in and get a finger prick done, a little bit of blood taken out, and get up to 30 tests done in that little tiny vial. They're saying that once it's fully rolled out, they're going to save, there, there's a possibility of saving Medicare and Medicaid $200 billion a year. $200 billion, that's with a B. That's a lot of money. Here's the other amazing thing. So, Elizabeth Holmes that we saw at the beginning, she's a self-made billionaire. Her company, she owns well more than 50% of the company. She's estimated to be worth $4.5 billion. Remember I said she dropped out of school when she was 19. How many 19 and younger people here? A few. Yeah, all the rest of you, this is going to make you feel really bad. Because <laughs> you're behind now. <laughs> what can I tell you? I am so far behind, it's not even funny. Uh, she dropped out at 19, 11 years later. She's got this company, they're rolling out. She's worth $4.5 billion, one of the newest members of the Forbes list. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Totally, radically changing the way the world works. Anybody know what these are? I know I'm going to get you on this. God damn it! Somebody knows. Yeah, those cheap microscopes. Ah, there you go. You're going to recognize it this way. Um, this is actually what, what it comes from. I was trying to, like, you know, fool you guys. I watched the TED Talk. There you go. So it's called the fold code. And if you know what, uh, we've all used microscopes before, right? You know, thousand dollars, a couple of thousand dollars. If you need to use them for any kind of real purpose, not the ones that we have in school, it's for like real things, they're really expensive. <coughs> These guys have figured out, and here's the bill of goods. They figured out a way to build a microscope for 50 cents to diagnose malaria. 50 cents. Not thousands of dollars. And it's, it's an origami-based microscope. So it comes on this printed piece of paper, you fold it up, you stick the lens in there, you stick the LED light in there, you stick the battery in there. And for 50 cents, you've got a microscope. Think about how that can change the world, right? Think about how quickly then you can figure out if somebody has malaria or not, and how you're going to treat that. It's a technology that's been around for a long, long time, right? We've had microscopes for a long time. And it took somebody to go in and say, you know, I think we can do this better. These microscopes, which are really pieces of cardboard, plastic lens and a light, uh, you can step on them, they don't break. You can drop them from a, the third, floor, third story of a building and they don't break. They still continue to work. There's no reason why somebody else couldn't have come up with this. But fortunately, somebody has. Let's talk about... Solar panels. I'm not going to quiz you as to what this is. <laughs> you all know what this is, right? But how about if we made them in a different shape? How about if we made them so that you could actually drive on them? How about then if you could use them? I don't know if you can tell, but on the left side there it's snow, on the right side it's not snow because the solar panels have melted away the snow. How about then if we took these solar panels and instead of using asphalt for roads, we use solar panels? Thinking about kind of what, you know, I don't know if anybody ever really thinks about roads. I don't think about roads. But think about how much of this country is paved in roads. These guys actually did an analysis to figure out if they paved all roads very conservatively and you know, kind of reduce down how much energy each one made and how much light they got and all that stuff. The roads in the U.S. could generate about 13 gigawatt hours. I think billions of gigawatt hours. It's a big number. Uh, and and the, the number of, uh, the amount of energy that we actually use is something like 3 gigawatt hours. So by a factor of four times more of what we use here in the U.S., we could generate just on the roads. But what's amazing, too, is that then you could do Kind of smart roads, right? That's what this becomes. You can have these solar panels out there and they could change their markings, they could tell you the speed to go on, they could tell you all of these things to do to make 
driving safer. We had roads for a long time. We had solar panels for a long time. It took somebody to figure out, hey, let's marry these two things together and make it work. These guys actually did an Indiegogo campaign. They were trying to raise a million dollars. They ended up raising $2.2 million. They've been invited to the White House. They've showed off their technology. They've gotten grant money from the Department of Transportation. Hopefully, at some point, you know, this technology is going to be something that we all see out on the roads. Because it's going to make us all safer. So you've got, like, you can see the moose there. Uh, I don't know, it's funny looking, but when you actually watch the video, it shows you know, the, the road could actually detect that there's animals on the road and warn drivers before they get there. So you're not running into animals, causing accidents, killing the animals. It could save a lot of lives, it could save a lot of property. It's a big idea. It's something that, you know, really once you hear it, it seems kind of obvious that somebody should have done. So the reason why I haven't really, uh, and I told these guys I didn't want to share the, the title of my talk because Honestly, in the last couple of days, I decided that this is what I wanted to talk about. Because I wanted all of y'all to think about some of these ideas and some of the things that other people are doing. Because really, when it kind of comes down to it, when you're doing this thing, you're doing this for a weekend, you're doing this going forward, what you guys need to all do is you need to dream big. We have lots of people that dream small dreams. We don't need that. We need people to dream big dreams. We don't need them to dream big dreams, but we need you to change the world as well. Because, you know, I, I don't know if you believe in life after death, reincarnation, you know, heaven, whatever. It doesn't really matter. You really have only one go around in this body, at least, even if you believe in reincarnation, right? You really have one chance. So utilize the time that you've got and do something big. You may not succeed, but that's okay. Because if you don't, you're going to come back and you're going to do it the next time and you're going to do it better and you will succeed the next time. But if you decide to take some small little idea, yet another photo sharing app or something silly like that, you might be successful. You might make some money. But are you going to change the world? Are you really going to be happy with what you've accomplished at the end of it? Maybe, maybe not. For me, I know doing something good, helping a lot of people, changing the world, having a big idea, that's really empowering. It's really energizing. The money and all that stuff at the end of it doesn't really matter. So that's all I've got for you all. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, comments, complaints, arguments, anything. Are you all awake? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I do not know. I am married, so I don't know about it. I bet you there's a lot of people drinking things like that. Marry up. Besides Startup Riot, what are you doing now? Besides Startup Riot, what am I doing now? Um, yeah, so I didn't talk about Startup Riot at all. Uh, I'll tell you what Startup Riot is in case you don't know about it. Uh, Startup Riot is a day-long event that I started in 2008 um, after, I, uh, after we sold the company, after the digital envoy, uh, and that was one of my ways of giving back and helping out other entrepreneurs. So uh, Startup Riot is a day-long event. We get 30 entrepreneurs up on the stage to do three-minute, four-slide presentations all throughout the day, um, three minutes of Q&A, this whole thing. Uh, the next one is actually, I just announced earlier this week. Uh, it's coming up on March 4th, uh, which is a Wednesday. It's an all-day event. Uh, so I do that. Um, I am involved in all kinds of random organizations and whatnot. So one of the things I actually tweeted about uh, yesterday, and I just realized I didn't talk about it, uh, before when I showed Vince Cerf, I've been kind of teasing uh, this fact that there's something coming on March 30th. Uh, so Vint is actually coming to town on March 30th, uh, and we're going to be doing a breakfast event on the 30th. Uh, he and I, we're going to be sitting down and just doing a fireside chat. Uh, it's, the Atlanta Press Club is uh, kind of sponsoring that and, and hosting that with us. Uh, so you should keep an eye open if you are interested in that. Uh, it will be a paid event. Uh, unfortunately, there will be tickets. I don't know how much they're going to cost. The Press Club uh, manages that. Um, so, so keep an eye for that. Uh, so I do those things. I'm actually working on a side project uh, as well, uh, which is top secret. Uh, but it's in the email space. I'm, I'm out to fix email. Uh, we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, but the other thing that I'm doing that uh, is somewhat related is uh, I've been working at Georgia Tech 
uh, in a program there called Startup Summer, uh, where over the summer we're taking undergrad teams from kind of idea to launch startup over the summer. So there's a bunch of other stuff too, but it's a mishmash of stuff and it's fun. Go ahead. Um, so you also involved with short adventures? Is that right? Is it now called good uh, good question. I think we need to actually take shot put off. So shot put was um, a, a early precursor to, to uh, kind of what's going on at Tech Village and Tech Village. So uh, you probably know the name David Cummings. There's a bunch of other folks that were involved in shot put ventures. Uh, we all put money together and we invested in a bunch of startups. Um, after a while, we realized that uh, a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, trying to invest in companies, none of us really had time to go out and find investments. And so we kind of petered out. And so we rolled all of our money over into Flashpoint Ventures, which is the, the incubator over at Georgia Tech. Um, so Shotput is not that active anymore. Uh, basically, we've given all our money to somebody else to make them invest it. Uh, so, so yeah, our money is in, in Flashpoint, in the Flashpoint fund now. Yeah. 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 I applied for Flashpoint. Okay. Did you get in? Don't know yet? No. I should talk to you. Uh, yeah. uh, I have no secret sauce into getting flash into, into Flashpoint. We're just the money guys uh, when it comes to that. Uh, so I know they have a lot of demand uh, for limited slots, but uh, it's a great program. What else? Okay, we'll start here and then I'll get you guys over here. Go ahead. I was curious about your, your technology that you developed. Um, IPs are registered in blocks to countries and whatnot, correct? And what layer of uh, advancement does your technology add to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so great question. So uh, the question was, uh, IP addresses are uh, assigned in blocks to countries. Uh, so yes and no, they are. Uh, back in the day, they used to be. Uh, there are uh, kind of, this is going to get into like super nerd tech talk here. Um, three major registries across the world. There's a bunch of others too. But Aaron Wright, Apnic, that kind of manage the allocation of IP addresses. So from them, they would allocate them to companies, and then companies would use them however. Uh, the thing is, that kind of allocation actually doesn't tell you anything about where the IP address is actually being used. So think of an example of IBM, right? Back in the day, uh, in dial-up days, which was probably before everybody's time here, uh, but I remember dial-up days. Uh, IBM used to run uh, dial-in network all around the world, okay? So all of their IP addresses were uh, set in those registries to uh, Schenectady, New York, okay? They were actually used everywhere. So the technology that I created, uh, and if you're super interested, and I don't know why you would be, uh, there's nine patents on the technology, and you can read them and bore yourself um, and, and be excited about it. Uh, I'm not excited about it anymore, but uh, it, it actually will get down to the, the city level, so worldwide city level. Answer the question? Yes? Okay. Uh, there were two over here, right here, and then I'll get you over here. Yeah. Yeah, I'll start with you and I'll go. All right. Your call. Uh, what made you sell? What, um, how what did you make the decision? Yeah, what made me sell? Uh, well, it wasn't really my decision, uh, honestly. So uh, we raised $12 million in, uh, in money. Uh, a million and a half in angel money, $10.5 million in venture money. Uh, wait, how much time do we have? Uh, time for this question and another one. OK. Um, I realized I should have asked that before. Uh, and so we had $12 million, so we had investor money, okay? The thing with investor money is uh, investors need a return, right? So that means you are going to sell. If you take other people's money, or PM, uh, you are going to have to sell at some point because they're going to want their money back and then some. Uh, and part of it, it honestly became the mechanics of when some of these venture funds needed to have good returns to be able to raise their next fund. So entrepreneurs don't necessarily really understand a lot of times the mechanics of everything that goes on with, a, with venture capitalists. The money that venture capitalists that are giving you to invest in your company, that's not their money, by and large. Very few cases that, that that's not the case, but by and large, that is money that they've gotten from other investors. Right? So those investors are leaning on these guys, these venture capitalists that have invested in you. right? So they need to show positive returns to those investors to be able to get them to give them more money for the next time they're raising money for another fund, okay? So when you have that kind of situation and you're at a certain point in the life cycle of some of these venture capital funds, pressure starts going up, especially if uh, 
they know that you're going to be able to sell for a positive return for them. Because they're going to want to use that news to be able to go to another investor and say, see, I was able to return four times the money because I'm just so smart. I'm saying that sarcastically because that's not always true. <laughs> a lot of times it's lucky. Um, and so, you know, give me more money or give me money. So that's really kind of the motivation of why that happened. It was a good, it was a good offer. Uh, it was a good return for everybody at the table. So I kind of can't say no. Go ahead. Last question. Okay. Well, major, oh, that's an easy question. Um, I was, uh, at Georgia Tech, I was electrical engineering, specializing in computer engineering. Uh, and then I did an MBA here. So uh, I actually left uh, uh, Digital Envoy before we sold. I left in 05, because I was tired of working. I took a break. And very fortunately, right here, we have a one-year MBA program, which most schools do not, and definitely most top-tier schools do not. And so I did the one-year MBA here from 05 to 06. Uh, and then I did a little consulting work in the So, can I sneak in one more? Is that so short? Yeah? Okay, go ahead. Um, oh, man, that's a good story then. Um, and that's a good question. Uh, so, the hardship was this. So, we talked about how, how pleasant it was that I raised $12 million. Well, there's a whole backstory there. So, if you don't recall, I'm going to set the, set the scene a little bit. So uh, in the kind of dot-com days, uh, everything started to implode around 2001. Uh, stock market crash, everything started going hell in a handbasket. It was not good. We started raising our fundraising round in October of 2000. 